Hello and welcome to another edition of In Theo Radio, where we talk about shamanism, psychedelics, and altered states for healing. This is your captain speaking, Captain Hugh T. Alchemy, also known as Trevar. I'm here with two very special guests today. We're going to take a focus on the sacred mushroom rituals of the Mexican Mesoamerican subcontinent. And I'm bringing back a, a new little friend of mine, uh, Rain Grant. She's going to be co-hosting with me today. Say hi to everyone, Rain. Well, hello, hello, and welcome. Thank you for being here and listening to this good info, Tom. Okay. <laughs> and so we have Tom Lane here, who is a author, and he is our a new guest. Um, welcome. Say hello. 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 Hey. Yeah, thank you for coming. I'm going to read your bio, Tom, for the audience who's listening. Uh, Tom, Tom Lane, uh, after leaving his job as a forest ranger on a Hoopa Indian reservation in California, spent nine months in um, 1973 living in the jungles of Palenque and the Sierra Madres of Sierra Madres del Pacifico of Oaxaca, training with one curandera and two curanderos, um, learning the ancient sacred rituals of healing, divination, spiritual traveling through the sacred mushroom ceremonies. These ancient rituals were, which were forbidden to outsiders, are um, were uh, outsiders are before revealed for the first time in this extraordinary journey into the world of the Mayans, Zapotec, and the Mazatec. Written from Tom's 1973 diary, while uh, while through Hiking the Appalachian Trail from Georgia to Maine in 2016, it was originally for his three sons and adopted Vietnamese daughter about this time and his, uh, and how he met their mother, Shirley, during the velada at the home of Maria Sabina, who was a known curandera of mushroom shamanism, during his second excursion to Cuautla de Jimenez in Mexico. Tom is an internationally acclaimed solar in energy trainer and the only solar contractor amongst, among uh, 45 inductees to the International Solar Hall of Fame in 1976. Wow. So, Tom, you're, you're really out there. There's this last little part about your book. Um, in fact, I'll let you tell, talk about your book. Uh, so you got a book out there, Sacred Mushroom Rituals. You know, it's called Sacred Mushroom Rituals. It's a search for the blood of Quetzalcoatl. This book, uh, I spent a lot of time on it. I started writing it in 1973, and I waited about 40 years to finally publish it. I took a six-month hike on the Appalachian Trail to write it, and part of it was uh, that I didn't want those people to be bothered or have some people, you know, bother them like they had bothered the people in Waltla. Now, when I went to Waltla, it was sealed off by the Army and the Federales. You had to sneak in or get in some way because uh, Europeans and Westerners and Mexican so-called yippies or hippies couldn't get in there or even any Europeans or Westerners. You had to have a reason for going in there. And I also participated in a lot of the other areas of uh, Sierra Madres and, and Waltla where I participated in different ceremonies of uh, with the sacred mushrooms. So, sacred mushrooms. So yeah, let's let's go into that. What exactly are sacred mushrooms? What do you mean? What species of mushrooms are we talking about? Well, I'm basically talking about uh, the Salaspi species. In Palenque, my first experiences, uh, especially at the rain uh, waterfall at Misoha was with the Salaspi Kabenskis. There was a lot of Salaspi Kabenskis there. Kibenskis. And it tends to be in various places, but in certain places, there were certain types of mushrooms, like especially in uh, Walla and most of the Oaxacas, there was the, uh, what people some called the Durumbis or the Salaspi Carolusans. Uh, so and brilliant. also uh, Slosby Mexicana. Uh -huh. In particular, in certain places, there was the Slosby Zapatacorum that was unbelievable. That was the one where they often are on landslides, but when I ate them in San Augustine the Sicha, they were right on top of graves. They were on like graves of different people in Brujos there in the cemetery. Wow. 
So you're saying that they, they, the derombles, um, some of the Salasabis apotecorum or the landslide mushrooms, as I understand derombles to mean. Uh, well, derombles uh, refer to a landslide. Now, certain types of mushrooms really tend to grow on raw, bare earth, like the graveyards, or like the western graveyards you see with a mound on the top, even in the middle of a swampy area. But, you know, after a hurricane or a heavy, heavy storm that hits the, the Sierra Madres, uh, uh, there'll be a lot of these type of mushrooms grow. The Zapotecorum are quite unique, and they have way, 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 way more psilocin than psilocybin to any of the others. Now, some of them get names like the Mexicana. The, they call them the pajaritos or little birds, mm -hmm. or the caruslans. Uh, that was uh, referred to as the drum, Durumbis. The uh, it is referred to that is sort of like a Christ consciousness sometimes, where the Salasti Cabensis they would call the San Isidro mushroom after the patron oh. saint of, of hard workers. Yeah, and then the Zapotecorum. There were all sorts of legends about them that dragons lived underneath them. They their name of them was the Crown of Thorns. Yeah, uh, because they were considered too bastante for most people, and they wouldn't want to try this particular mushroom. Wow, that is a mushroom that I've um, long awaited to uh, to cultivate and to experience. I've I've experienced some of the mushrooms of the Pacific Northwest, including uh, one of the the psilocybes that is considered the most potent um, that they've found in the wild. Is called um, the Blue Angels or the Azurens, and uh, I've. I've heard uh, a friend of mine, Alan Rockefeller, who's a, a skilled taxonomist who goes down to uh, Mexico. Um, he gives out uh, spores of Zapotecorum, and that's becoming more popular amongst cultivators here in the States. Well, I can see why I met Alan quite a few times and gone mm -hmm. to some of his talks. And uh, I sent him one of his books because he let me use a lot of his photographs in my books, I could have just sort of got, he's got so many on Wikipedia, he's by far the best photographer, and I don't know if you've ever seen his poster, there's sort of two of them, one that he doesn't show very much, it's uh, an, a, a made by a guy from the University of Florida's mycology department, it's called Sacred Mushrooms and it's in Rituals, but I love his one that he helps support the people with down there called Ango Sagrados de Mexico, you know, the Angos uh, Sacred Mushrooms of, Me of Mexi Mexicana. And he gives some of those, uh, what you would call nicknames on them, like the Little Birds, the Landslide of Durumbies, the San Isidro, the Crown of Thorns, or, you know, in the legends of these mushrooms that dragons even grow underneath them. Yeah, that's fascinating. I'm very excited about that. Did you have something to say, Rain? Oh, I was going to ask about the blue... Uh, we what was the blue variety of uh, psilocybe you were talking about? Um, but I was going to ask, is that the same one that you would make blue honey with? Because I've used other types of psilocybin mushrooms to try to create this blue honey of sorts, but it never it turns blue like um, like the rest. Well, of I think that there's a lot of mistakes about the honey, and a lot of people don't really okay. know. The well, honey wait. is used in a lot of the sacred ceremonies, but here's the interesting thing. Hold on, hold on, Tom. So just for our audience listening, blue honey is any of the blue staining mushrooms in honey. And that's just a general modern. Oh, okay. Recipe. All right. I got it. And it's for, not going to turn blue every single time. It, so it isn't. It's kind of like a variety of colors and sometimes it's a greenish, but yeah, I did. I do want to talk about the honey and I was doing some research earlier about what you said about the, the wasps. Oh, but let's, 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 let's wait a second. Cause I want, okay. I want to answer her question about taxonomy, the blue angels. Uh -huh. Also known as the, I think the UFOs, um, they're Psilocybe azurens, and they grow in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and uh, they, I think, have more baocysteine than other ones. Okay. Um, and they're and they're different than Aztecorum. They're different than Ceruleans. They're different than Mexicana, and they're different than Zapotecorum. And these are all Psilocybe blue staining mushrooms. Sure, sure. Personally, I think it's way, way more important three aspects of how you take them than any one particular variety. Yeah. Oh, so yeah, let's let's get into that. 
Tom, tell us how they, that you learned um, in the 70s, you say in the 70s when you're traveling down there? Yeah, uh, 73. Jeez, long time ago. Yeah, it, it was really primitive back then. Most of the roads were dirt roads. Uh, there was no electricity lines. There was no radio. There was no television. There was no refrigeration. When you were in a village, there was nothing plastic. Uh, I watched some Indians one time that had been playing and heard a recording for the first time ever. There was, you know, in a ceremony they had been recording, but this was a uh, pretty isolated conditions, you know, and I went pretty, pretty far off of the main tourist parts, a lot of it, because some of the times we felt like the federales were after us, the people I were with. They had raided this one area that they normally didn't come to to get rid of these people from California. Now, I'll talk a little bit about that in my book. But the thing that I think is over really lower looked a lot of people is that Quetzalcoatl, the winged, jewel-plumed female male serpent, is basically the basis of these sacred ceremonies. And there was a man, Quetzalcoatl, who was a leader king of the Toltecs. He'd taken over from his father. Okay. And he created the city of God and all this jewelry and everything. The main thing he did was he stopped war between tribes. He stopped human sacrifice. And he brought all this artistic stuff. There was like this explosion, you know, of all a Tiwatibukan and all this stuff happened. You have to realize that before this, if you look from an anthropological standpoint, anthropologist, people were really primitive and they didn't have God's like we think of them in the, uh, they tend to have witches and sorcerers, but not like we think of a witches and sorcerers. These were people that would rule the tribe and mainly cause they could go into some sort of trance or something and find out where the deer or the game was. You know, they didn't have much agriculture. So part of the transition of Quetzalcoatl was also bringing corn besides all the art and the singing and the dancing. And, uh, a lot of this philosophy is based on the Tuk, which is totally different than Eastern or Western philosophy. You've got to realize when they're talking about a God, they're not thinking about like a Roman or Greek or Tibetan or Egyptian or Chinese or pagan God. They give these names energy forces. And the only one that really has what you'd say human, uh, like you would relate to human, is like Quetzalcoatl mainly because he was both male and female and he could come in the, like in the wind. And in certain ceremonies, he actually does come in the wind. It just is amazing. But he taught these sacred ceremonies. And then a lot of people believe he left to the Mayans to Culiacan and he became Culiacan among the Mayans. But uh, there was sort of three people that developed out of these ceremonies, uh, groups, that were what you'd call the followers of Quetzalcoatl, even though nobles and some people would participate in them. One was the uh, priest and priestess of Talak, and they were, uh, Talak was like a brother that uh, could transform himself into Quetzalcoatl uh, and shift as an avatar. They, sometimes these people get really weird. They have five or six avatars, and sometimes somebody becomes a grandmother. But you got to realize these are all forms of energy and motion. They didn't believe in anything fixed, and they believed life and death had the same spine. And so uh, the, this sacred female male bird, from the penis of this bird, the blood that hit the earth, the sacred mushrooms grew, which implies a lot of sexual energy between the earth and the sun. And if you follow some of these ceremonies, it's all about rebirth. Like, for instance, the uh, Mesoamericans believe there are only two important days in, in your life, the day you were born and the day you figure out why. You know, and <laughs> that was what the ceremony was for, was through, through rebirth. Now, a lot of these were healing ceremonies. There were certain ceremonies as the de deified uh heart, which was to meet Quetzalcoatl, and there was ones like uh, what are called the disembodied eye, 
uh, which has to do sort of like with astral traveling. And then there were other ceremonies among groups of people to, you know, sort of have the travel situation become very peaceful. But the uh, priest and priestess of Talak, uh, the Aztecs allowed them to stay around because, see, the Aztecs came in and found Tiwatiwakan. 900 years after it had been created and said, our ancestors, we found this, our ancestors did that. Of course, it wasn't true that they did, but they allowed the priest and priestess because they had a lot of healing ability and ability to make it rain. They would send to the mountain to rain. And then there was also uh, the jaguar and eagle religious warrior knights. They were a type of knight. And they had a special place they met carved out of a mountain hidden way away in Malenko where they celebrated the uh, sacred mushroom rituals. And then you also had a group called the Pocatecas. And the Pocatecas, we would say, might be the adventurers. They are the people that went traveling and did all the trading. And they would trade for stuff, and they were sworn to fair trade. And they brought back feathers. They brought back jade. They brought back gold. They all brought all sorts of stuff back to the nobility and the warriors and the empire. Did they bring back uh, mushrooms? What? Did they bring mushrooms? I, oh, well, yeah, and they taught these sacred ceremonies, the sacred ceremonies that were taught, but they were sort of like when they get back, they had to live in a humble house. And every now and then, the head of them would come around and say, okay, we're going to have a party. Everything in your house, we're going to give away or sell, and you're going to have a party. You know, so oh. it was uh, party. a religion sort of self-sacrifice. The idea of the deified heart was a sacred ceremony to both meet and become Quetzalcoatl, to enjoin him. And he will come in these other ceremonies. He does come. And, and you, you, could talk, you could talk to uh, C. Michael Smith. I know a lot of other people have witnessed him, and sometimes he'll come in every ceremonies. But in this particular ceremony, it was a ceremony with intent to both meet and join and, and actually uh, become Quetzalcoatl. And... Part of the ceremony was you were expected to have done a lot of daytime and some nighttime ceremonies before, especially during the day, during clouds, and sometimes during lightning storms. And you would have done ceremonies at night, but you're you're going to fast at least 24 hours before this ceremony. And when these people do this, there's not a lot of talking. There's not a lot of talking going on. And then in my book, I mentioned on one page, uh, the legend was that Quetzalcoatl gave the cacao for two purposes. One as an aphrodisiac. And the other was for a precursor of these sacred mushroom ceremonies. Now, if you take the raw cacao beans, which you do before the ceremony, Maria Sabina did this too, and you, you grind them up, okay? Uh, and... Now, uh, you just make a coffee out of them and drink it, you know, and uh, it's from the raw beans, not anything artificial. And there's two bliss transmitters in there. One of them. Raw beans, like fresh, or are they dried or prepared? In yeah, they're way? just the beans. They're just the beans. You can buy them online. For me. And them. They're not expensive. You can get whole bags for $25. They're not roasted. They're fermented, though? Uh they're not roasted. No, they're just, they've just been taken out of the cacao pod and taken out and put and put as a bean, like you pick a peanut out of a peanut, you know? Okay. Sure, sure. And that's where chocolate came from. But what happens is in the Dutch process, they put uh, chemicals in there and alkaloids, they heat it up and they put it under pressure and then they add milk and sugar to it. Sure. This was, you basically boil water like you could grind it up in a coffee grinder. I keep it in the fridge cold before I grind it up. You can grind it up in a coffee grinder and then I boil water and when it quits bubbling, then I pour it in it and stir it up. And I drink the little particles too because I like the feeling. Now this is done two to three hours before. If you read about it, it releases a tremendous amount of serotonin. So the idea is it's going to get you in a good mode. It's going to get you feeling good and everybody's feeling good. And then in the ceremony, you would take... Sounds good right now. <laughs> yeah, right. We should all be sipping some cacao right now. Right. Yeah. Uh, I didn't have time to make mine. Yeah. 
And uh, next time, then in the ceremony, you would sometimes build a little fire and you would play candles in the four directions. And then sometimes people would go up, blow a conch cell, especially to the east. But the, the important thing was that you had live living mushrooms, like that we brought out of the woods and in bowls with the earth and everything. Or people could do this, bring in live mushrooms or maybe ones that are growing. And right before we start about 30 minutes, we'll start singing to them. Now people will sing just from their heart or sing whatever, they're singing to the mushrooms. And I know this sounds unbelievable, but I've actually seen people without, and these without on the mushrooms actually pass out from seeing this. They start moving back and forth on their stipes like this or stems or up or down. It's like they're dancing, but they're not moving back and forth like that. Hmm. I totally and believe that mushrooms because I like to holy sing food for the body. That's one of the things my, the Curandero uh, Francisco Ramirez worked with. He said, for anything else, it's food. You know, it's, everything was hard, at, you know, living and everything around there. You know, there was no refrigeration. So it's food and food for our body. And the Aztecs call this the holy flowers of the blood. Now, if you see the Stellas of Subchamilico, these were in the high temple of the Aztecs and the Spanish broke them into three pieces and uh, painted them red. That was like destroying their guidance. These were guides to the ceremony like the Yutu Tono Codex or the Vienna Codex. They have the flowers of the blood and you can see the sacred mushroom as a flower on the tongue like that with mushrooms out the side. And, and of course, at this stage, it's Tolok and Tolok's eyes. Well, you eat, you eat, you eat these mushrooms, and when you're eating them uh, with the honey, two at a time, and that's sort of symbolic to represent male and female, uh, to remind you of that, is you never, ever swallow. You never, ever, ever swallow. You just keep chewing and chewing and chewing and chewing. And a book, book I hate to go into this scientifically, but the what's happening is subliminally and buccally, it's going into the bloodstream because your saliva and the honey have changed the carbohydrate of the mushroom to pure glucose. It's like a blood transfusion. And the psilocybin has been changed to psilocin. And what's happening is going in your mouth, your tongue, your gums, and the roof of your mouth go straight to the spine and straight to your brain. Absolutely straight. That makes sense. And the inside of your cheeks, like I'm pinching, pinching here or, or your tongue, that's why sometimes I would press it a little bit against my cheek because I was swirling around in my mouth. That goes straight to the ventral aorta of the heart. That's part of what they call the ceremony, the deified heart. And recently they found out that, you know, the heart and the body have a type of intelligence and can instruct you too. And I really believe that's the key to people solving a lot in their life is connecting up to both the heart the conscious and the unconscious but in this sacred ceremony when you're eating you just keep eating them covered with honey and then it then it's like you'll stop you'll know when to stop because it's like your flesh is starting to disappear so they're just pouring the the honey directly onto fresh uh, freshly picked mushrooms and then well we would have a little bowl with the honey we'd have a little bowl with the honey now, Tom, okay. you were Get saying the mushrooms in and stir them up so they were totally covered and then stick them in our mouth. Okay. So they were absolutely covered with honey. Like, uh, yeah, just stick, you're sticking the mushrooms in honey and cover them. Yeah. So this is interesting. I mean, blue honey is this really interesting topic that has been uh, talked about on the internet a lot. You mentioned the other day when we were having the pre interview uh, handshake call that it was a honey that came from a specific hornet and no, I went a, up, a wasp a wasp, a wasp. wasp. and Everybody, i went up i went up on wikipedia and it started it poking around speed, but it's actually really a wasp so so i started doing some research and i'm i think it's this species brachia gastria mellifica is that it the b mellifica well i sent you uh, in the uh, thing I sent you about the Vienna Codex, I sent you about, there was about this bee in there. Okay. And the bee was really honored by the Mayans. For instance, they had two celebrations a year. They would, when they 
and they consider the beast somewhat a sort of like a god. Right, right. And and so what I'm seeing also is there's this there's this continuity of uh of even like the rain deities uh that we deal with in the Norse canon. We have to- Twalak or Twalak in the Aztec and then Chak, which is the Mayan version of that word and and the Mayan deity and then Cochio Cochiho Kuchiho or something like they You're talking about the female goddess. Right. Okay. So they yeah, have she transitioned into the Virgin Mary. There's a whole chapter not, I mean the Virgin of Guadalupe. She, there, absolutely. There's all sorts of articles about how she transitioned into the Virgin of Guadalupe. Wow, very interesting. So it it feels like the some of the deities are pretty consistent across all of uh, the different eras of Mexican civilization, uh, pre-Columbian Mexican civilization, and they have something to do with rain and lightning and storms. Yeah, uh, especially Tlaloc with rain and storm, and, and Quetzalcoatl especially with wind. And, and, and I've been in the desert before when it's dead at night, and all of a sudden uh, it's unbelievable. You have like a whirlwind around you, and all of a sudden Quetzalcoatl arrives when there's been no wind for a long, long time or long afterwards. Mm. And he was known as the god of wind and storms in his particular form as, uh, I think it was uh, uh, Levin Reed or uh, Siakal. And he had different names for his different avatars. That makes sense. And it's interesting because it's like a almost like a living Santeria or saints religion where like saints show up as avatars in in the tradition of of incarnation in those civilizations, right? So they can they're gods and spirits, but then they can also kind of take a human form. Is that what I'm hearing? Well, I don't think they take human forms exactly like humans do, but I don't know. You know, when Albert Hoffman took the mushrooms in Switzerland. He saw Aztec priests and Aztec knights and all this stuff. Mm-hmm. And I took the mushroom at certain ceremonies and I would see on the adobe wall just all these Aztec figures and motifs running. And I had, you know, I'm just sitting there stunned. I don't have any idea what it is, but I see them. But I had a friend who was a Russian midget escaped from Russia in the Second World War, uh, coming back when the Germans and made it to America. Albert Krauss and a Vietnamese friend of mine, uh, Con Den, who was a, a Buddhist from Vietnam, and neither one of those had heard a word about, not anything about Aztecs, and they all saw the same thing. Wow. See, the, and a lot of those, you, you know these pyramids have musical motifs on them, and sometimes when you're doing wow. those ceremonies, you can see those portals coming. You can see those musical portals coming. Interesting. And then uh, you should always go in with intent. That's one thing I learned from my uh, Francisco Ramirez and something. Uh, he told me one time I was like, I had to have intent. I had to, there was had to be a reason. In this particular ceremony, he held up a mushroom like this to me, and it literally became an eyeball. And it was like, oh follow me around and looking at me. And if I hadn't known he was a good person, I'd have really been <laughs> bothered by that. But in this sacred ceremony, when you, the sacred ceremony of the deified heart, well, what happens to me and happens to a lot of people is then after your body disappears, your skeleton starts to disappear. And then you feel like only your skull is left. Oh. And then you start coming back and it feels like your spine is moving, like your spine is moving all around like um uh, sort of crazy you know like a spinal and wave a lot of people tell me that's a kundalini i don't know what you know to me i'm just describing what's happening mm-hmm. but the spine is starting to move all over and that's when quetzalcoatl comes and uh it's just like everybody says it, it's uh jeweled and many many diamonds all in like just like the dragon, but it's not like a Godzilla or anything. It's about human height or Quetzalcoatl is. And, you know, you enjoin Quetzalcoatl, you walk into him Hmm. in this ceremony. And it's like everything turns into pure white light or some people that are healing 
Quetzalcoatl will actually swallow them in a patient. I was out in Utah in Goblin Valley. We were trying to heal a person been in a motorcycle accident. And he was laying down and Quetzalcoatl swallowed him just like a big anaconda and he went through him. Wow. And, uh, you know, he was healed. And uh, I think what it is is one of the most powerful, powerful forms of, of uh, pure life energy that comes. Uh, I know a lot of my friends that are Buddhists believe it's a Naga or that okay. this sacred mushroom that Quetzalcoatl found the secret to meeting this Naga. And then later when he left, people gave this ceremony the name of Quetzalcoatl because if you were a man or woman and you participated in this ceremony, after it's over, you gained the right to be called Quetzalcoatl and you called each other Quetzalcoatl. And that was, it, it was uh, basically Quetzalcoatl taught Everything is love and pain, but you have to have joy about whatever is happening. And uh, he tried to end any sacrifices. And he said, the only thing you should ever sacrifice is like a uh, flower or butterfly, something like that. Hmm. And uh, so would you say it's but, similar to like Christ consciousness? What were you saying? Were you saying that earlier? Or have I well, I would say that? so. You know, uh, all sorts of people thought he was Christ. The Mormons think he was Christ. Right, yeah. Some people think he was St. Thomas. Some think he was an Irish monk. Some think he was a Buddhist monk. There is all sorts of stories. But I think the main thing is the real truth is the experience itself of taking the sacred mushrooms this way. You will meet and encounter Quetzalcoatl, and he will come. And, like, when you see people that do this, it's amazing the bio photons come in their eyes. Their eyes look like they've got flashlights in their brain. Hmm. And their whole face starts to glow. And the Aztec said, in this ceremony, your soul life will be implanted on your face from your heart. Your soul life from your heart will be implanted, and the whole body glows. Mm. And the healing in this is unbelievable because the body just feels incredible. It's like all this energy is being used to heal. Very interesting. Sounds amazing. Uh, so we, if you're listening, you're just joining us, we have... Tom Lane here of solarwolf.org, and we have Rain Grant, Can Mushrooms Save the World documentary. She's rejoining us for a special interview where we're talking with Tom about sacred mushroom rituals of Mexico and Mesoamerica. Uh, I want to get back to some sciencey talk. Uh, I, went on, I went and looked on Wikipedia, so I got Brachiogastria mellifica, commonly known as the Mexican honey wasp, is a new, new, neotropical social wasp it can be found in both north and south america it is one of the few wasp wasp species that produces honey and is considered a delic this honey is considered a delicacy in some cultures in mexico uh, the wasp species is of use to humans because they used they used to control pest species and pollinate avocado plants oh okay no, no kidding so that's kind of, it's, it's sort of a trip that they, they, so honeybees, as far as I'm aware, aren't indigenous to uh, Mexico and North America. We introduced those with the Columbus and all the explorers and stuff. Yeah, it's part of the Columbian exchange. And uh, uh, Francisco Ramirez said the honey's the same. Honey's honey, you know, it's made from the nectar of the plant. It, it, the cones are real different though. The cones are, I'm sorry, I used to raise honeybees. Mm. Wow. Uh, the 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 uh, African ones and you know the, the they're much much thinner cones and they're sort of black and the and the honey is is really tasty but it but the little old bee it looked more like a ant to me with wings you know this is this is the the wasp you're talking about yeah yeah and it was uh, actual you actually used wasp honey over the mushrooms yeah. That is impressive, archaic, and and I I would assume that it has a special quality to it. They were saying um, in this article on Wikipedia about uh, Malefica, B. Malefica, the honey wasp of Mexico, that it was it was comparable to bees that had been um, wild foraging with a special plant. I'm trying to figure out what special plant it was. Like there's. There's bees that can go after, I think it was, oh, where is it? it I, mesquite. 
So like the desert honey that we get in the Southwestern. Yeah. Well, you know, when raising bees, here's the thing. I've raised a lot of bees and had hives and I've even worked with beekeepers. Mm -hmm. is bees get pollen from just about every single plant. They get, and, 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 and pollen can kill them if it's got insects all sides on it. It comes back in the hive because they drag it back on their legs. But they get that from all plants. But only certain plants do they get nectar from that they make the honey out of. There's only certain plants. And there are certain ones, and you know, orange groves, Tupelo honey. Mm -hmm. uh, we have one of swamp honey here. They, you know, in Florida. In swamp honey. What? Swamp honey? Yeah. Uh, no. These these berries, uh, gallberries, they call them gallberries. Wow. They're, they're, and Tupelo basically comes from swamp lands too. But any type of flower. Florida, Florida like, or Louisiana? For instance, in the spring and fall, my bees used to make a lot of honey from uh, uh, basically plum trees, the wild plum trees. And that honey tastes like black strap molasses. If you would wow. give a jar of my honey to 10 people, only one out of 10 would ever like this and they would love it. It tastes like uh, really strong, like black strap molasses. And of course, uh, clover honey, uh, you know, orange groves is very sweet. And there's a honey from Chile when I was down there, I got from bees called Uma that comes from a huge monster tree, unbelievably big tree. Wow. And it's sort of like a white honey. And honey's the purest food in the world because it doesn't have to be digested. It can actually go put it on your skin and have it go into your body. Sure. Have you heard of the psychedelic uh, honey from the, these honeybees actually make a psychedelic honey and I believe that's in Nepal and uh, well that, there's you know, people talking about pressure. that but I don't really think it's psychedelic from what I've read about it it's made from rhododendrons oh yeah well, um, basically getting been. poison you know just because you know they get this honey and it has the uh, ingredients from either probably the nectar and maybe some pollen or rhododendrons and it's really a type of poisoning right it's right like, that is a poisonous plant uh I just recently you know, saw like, a documentary uh, about it. They uh, went down went down there and studied these guys that would climb the cliffs to 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 gather this honey. And and the trips seemed to be extremely painful. So yeah. I, I wondered who would want to put themselves through and that. They, they like immediately get high on it right afterwards because they're all stung up, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, you got to watch out how some things because there's a lot of strange things in the Orient. I used to drink this type of sake called habu sake, which had the venom of a, like a, a copperhead or a rattlesnake in the sake. But it had been transformed, and it would unbelievably make you feel good. It was made in Okinawa. Wow. So, you know, just, I think you got to be aware of what a lot of these things are. You know, sometimes you've got to realize you're dealing with not an ethogen so much as you're dealing with a poison. And poisons have just different effects on the body. I mean, like, you know, having the flu and being really sick with something like the flu is, for instance, is almost hallucinogenic. You're, you're almost, some types of being sick or have a type of... Uh, sure, or being in a deep meditative state, like doing Tai Chi standing positions might put you in that zone. I've noticed that, you know, because you're working with the brain and energy and, and whatnot. Right. And the basic thing I found with the sacred mushroom and I write about that, and this is my book for the average person, is, you know, there's, I feel like the plant itself is the one that chooses who will have an opportunity, not that they have to accept it, but usually the choice involves one path or another, and they can't, they have to do it if, if they're going to take this path, but to be a curandero, or what you might call a, a medicine man or woman, but the uh, particular power of the mushroom to heal the body, to me, involves when you're sitting still and your conscious and unconscious mind are alive, and especially during the day, you can see your arms, you can see your body, and your heart through your body is intelligent, and it's part of the triangle that's going to instruct your mind. For instance, if you have a 
hateful thought, like uh, whatever it is, uh, it could be negative, it could be racist, it could whatever is like a thought that your body intuitively is not feeling good, your body is telling you, hey, get rid of that and change that channel. Because when we come out in the world, we come out with all this epigenetic DNA and all of this ancestral stuff, but also from the time we're born, we get all these things to build up as attentions in their, our body. And I've seen some people on sacred ceremonies, their first one, especially if they do a lot, just vomit stuff out of their body that's unbelievable or poop stuff out or just sweat yes. stuff out or they're getting rid of tensions in their body, places where it's locked up. And there isn't really an esoteric secret of that just to know that you can do it. And a lot of it depends on breathing, like breathing deeply, like and mm -hmm. let it go up and down your spine. You know, you can feel your breath, right? As you breathe in and out going, and you can stop it back and forth. And it's almost like playing a magical instrument to get rid of these tensions and everything. Absolutely, and absolutely. Change. Yeah, I do believe the tensions will make you more sick, you know, relaxing into it. And just, I, I find stepping into my gratitude and just feeling really grateful. And then my body relaxes. I notice that. And then the nausea would go away or whatnot. And I'm just like, yeah, you have to relax. The, the, uh, these things seem to, to bring out that, you know, show you where you have tensions and where you're having blockages in your body. Yeah. Well, that was basically what, uh, Quetzalcoatl taught was that we should have gratitude and joy for the love and the pain because this was our life and and there's no motion things can't move unless there's both love and pain and you know life and death share the same spine mm. and that uh with gratitude and joy we can live like we want to on this earth you know but the you see a lot of talks for example on ted talks or some sort of person who's pontificating about something talking and one of the things they often mention is in the morning, if you get up, if you can think something you're really grateful for, and just for a few minutes, and when you go to bed at night, think about something you're really grateful for and go to bed thinking about that. Well, it's an attitude because happiness is something you never acquire, but you can have joy, you know, and joy for living. And you may be happy about what's going on or not, you know. And the other thing Quetzalcoatl said that, the prime being the cosmos gave man and didn't care for too much was knowledge and not knowledge like, you know, the apple of good and evil, but that when you learn these ceremonies and you learn these certain things, you should be really, really humble because people that think they have knowledge, they're really, really uh, sort of like, yeah, it's, it's, you got to be very careful. You got to be really humble. And in some of these things that like, especially the one they call the crown of thorns, it gives you so much power of divination that you could see paths and ways that you would choose to go. And boy, it makes you, if you're a normal person, scared to death to think or let anybody know that you would think you have this power, that it belongs to you. You just stand on it. You just enjoy it. Or people come around you when you're doing it. I mean, it's not something that actually belongs to you. Right. It's just like if there was a waterfall or river going and you went and got in it and got in this waterfall or this river, this current of energy, it would be insane to say the river was yours, you know, but you could show people and say, Hey, there's a river. Let's go over in it. And, and, and all you have to do is realize whatever's happening here, you know, you have to approach it with uh, love and love out whatever you see because all these figures and things are coming. Sometimes in the beginning during the day, it's like you can see the little saint children and the little children playing and everything, and they're like little clowns. But some of these viajes are sort of what, where you want to go and, and, and the type of portals you want to enter in, in life. And that's why I say you should always consider this a sacrament. If you don't have something that's sacred in your life, you're in real trouble. I mean, to me, that's what this whole digital world and everything is coming to. They're trying to eliminate the sacred aspect of life. And I really believe what I'm telling you about Quetzalcoatl and Talak and these other people I've seen, it's like, it's not just me, other people did, but it's sort of like been hidden uh, this has been hidden 
a lot because I think people think you're a nutcase or they don't want to talk about it. It seems like a lot of this, uh, these more sacred like knowledge, like knowledge from the past, it seems like uh, in, throughout all of the different indigenous cultures throughout the world, a lot of it has been lost. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of uh, similarities between some of the things you're talking about with uh, the Aztec and, and, and the, you know, South American uh more more that that uh way of looking at things but the inuit and then also over towards siberia and whatnot and they study it you know that that's a totally different mushroom that they're in, in taking up there but i'm seeing similarities between some of the like, histories like saying that like the sperm of the gods somehow are spreading on the land and 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 and, and the mushrooms are spreading you know it's like a similar i see similarities there and um yeah, I, I find it interesting, but they've lost a lot of their information within their cultures as well. Um, well, you've got to realize the uh, Spanish and the friars, when they came, especially Cortez, these weren't the King's Spanish soldiers. These were bloodthirsty mercenaries. These were blacks from North Africa, Spanish Moors, Greeks, Portuguese, Italians, and they were all bloodthirsty mercenaries. And of course, when the priests came behind and they wanted to destroy all these ceremonies, nobody ever tried to even understand the metaphysics of the took and what this was all about. And a lot of these were destroyed. Now, some of the things have been found, like... Uh, Drama to the people. That's when we lose our, in, our information, you know? Yeah, well, for, fortunately, a lot of the Mexican stuff has been recovered. For instance, the... Uh, Vienna, our Vendiosa Codex, Mushroom Codex, page 25, has been recovered. Well, it wasn't recovered. It was taken to Austria. Okay. And it's sort of in worn-out shape in Austria, but the British Museum, I sent you a lot of pictures of the British Museum, you know, restoring that uh -huh. particular one. And that uh, shows the whole sacred ceremony with uh, two sages down by the the sacred river and this uh, mushroom sage or Cordero is talking to Quetzalcoatl in his form as uh, the wind god, a leaven reed. And then you see the, the actual symbols for the mushroom, like four lizard is a symbol. Four lizard symbol is for the mushrooms when they haven't been taken, the sacred mushrooms. Eleven lizard is a symbol when they're in you and you see Quetzalcoatl walking toward the sacred Valley of the Dead, where Talak was. And this was a ceremony of death and rebirth and going into the underworld to be reborn. Wow. And then above that, you see like Quetzalcoatl scraping the head of death with a special instrument he developed for mushroom ceremonies. It's this type of drum. And uh, they had asked him to make us a symbol like the other, but make us a symbol. And he said, but God's everywhere. Flowers, he's everywhere. Bees, you can't make a symbol. And they said, well, make something. So he made a tree and he said with arms outstretched, one for pain and one for love. And he carved this drum out of the, uh, uh, of the log while he's rasping on the head of death. And in these sacred ceremonies, you're supposed to be on like a straw mat or on the earth. And usually you have your shoes off and, it, and the symbols show this a lot. And what's happening, you're starting to resonate with the earth is all of a sudden your body's starting to vibrate and you can feel the earth vibrating up through you. But when you look at Sochapilli, who's the prince of flowers and ethogens looking at Quetzalcoatl, there's like a tear in his eye. He's just so happy that he's starting this journey. And back behind him is that black wasp bee that was used for the honey. That's a symbol. Then up above, you see these sacred things, the, the urn for the honey, the wall of creation, and they show ropes like, uh, and there's these symbols where you, you haven't completed your life and haven't been tied. But if you start at the bottom, there's a symbol for eternity. And, and right above that, when you start into the sacred mushroom ceremony, it's a symbol for a different type of time. A time that just seems to go on forever, but it's not like ordinary time. And it's a different symbol, like an A and uh, circled and I see it. The flint to the side of it. Now, then up above, you see seven initiates. One of the initiates is like you, you know, like it would be you or Rain or somebody that would be an initiate sitting in front of this. 
and they're all holding mushrooms. And almost every one of these are holding mushrooms, sometimes two, sometimes three. Uh, and then these, you have six different sacred deities that represent different type of portals like uh, Eagle Woman, non-Eagle Woman, uh, Eleven Reed and stuff. And then down below that you have Quetzalcoatl plunging into the underworld. It looks like he's plunging into what he's plunging in. And when he comes out, you can see that the ball of creation he has on his foot, the four different directions. And now he's, Talak is there in the Eagle Warrior garb and he's holding two mushrooms and Quetzalcoatl and his new, a different avatar, which has a face looking backwards and forward like Janus is holding three. And you see in the uh, sacred water, the, the knot has been tied into the rope. And now the foot's on the ball controlling the boat, of uh, uh, the ball of, uh, in other words, you're gaining control of your life. Okay. Does the ball time the, the wheel thing that? Well, it's, it looks like a ball. And in this trough, it looks like a floating ball, like a volleyball with four quadrants. Uh -huh. We have bare feet on the four quadrants and, uh, the one when he's plunging in, the ball is floating out. He doesn't have yes, his I life see. under control or organized. Yeah, you know they they considered you a vagrant on the earth till you uh, were reborn. You're just a vagrant here. For and, people that are uh, listening, when you're reborn, you have a purpose in life. Where where can people that are listening see this image? I, I'm looking at it right now. Are you looking at it, Ring? I'm not sure. I'm looking through the pictures that have been sent and I'm not like, I've got some of these really interesting uh, looking images here. Yeah, that's it. it. Uh, that's, that's it. Now it looks like the one you've got the actual real one, but it, um, I mean, that's in the museum in Austria because it looks like a washed out white. Austria. Whereas the uh, British museum did, did a reproduction. Yeah, that well. that's, so, that's the, See, that's the old Curandero, our sage, who's talking to Quetzalcoatl at the start of the ceremony. And you see the symbol for eternity right to the now, side of it. Now, do you have these pictures posted on your page, Tom? I know you have. You run a page on Facebook where you're posting a lot of this. Well, all of these on carrying. my Facebook, they're all there. Okay. And what's the name In of your book, Facebook page? The last chapter has about this. The first 280 pages, I said... Okay. That's for normies and then uh, normal people. And normies. I said, this is for people who want to go much deeper, who want uh, much more than just to be have some healing and uh, gain a new consciousness or a new way of looking at life and to be healed. I said, this is for people who want to really drill down into the, some of these sacred ceremonies. And uh, But the only thing I've really contributed to all of this because there is another uh, great thing the Mexican government archaeologists did re recently. It's called the, uh, if you look up the uh, Utah uh, Mushroom Codex, there's a thing called the pix pixographic representation of the first dawn and its association with uh, mushrooms now this is uh if you just google this pic pictographic representation of the first dawn and its association with eth ethnogenic mushrooms there's this huge whole long article the only thing they don't understand or miss because everybody's been trying to interpret this is about the black bee like peter first r gordon wasson uh carl de corgi he's the one that was Turn Watson on to all the mushroom stones. Okay, okay. And there's all sorts of people that have written about this. First, Watson, uh, and like I said, uh, but this thing now is. Uh, oh, I think I see it. Are you talking about the Mishtek one? Yeah, it's called the uh, Pictographic the Representation or, or of Stone. And it's association it with ethnogenic mushrooms in the 16th century. They built Mesotech Mushroom Codex. Yeah. Now, this is uh, it's, sort of like the official, what this is all about from the uh, Mexican archaeologists and others that have studied this. 
This is the one with four lizard in it? Yeah. Yeah, I can find it online. And for those of us who are looking for it, um, researchgate.net has a figure. Researchgate.net. And again, you want to look for mushrooms, representations of mushrooms. Um, and if you do the Vienna Mushroom Codex British Museum, and, and rain, you'll, you'll get up there uh, what they've tried to make it look like it was pre Columbian. Okay. It was discovered among the Mestec, which are the people of the clouds, but Cortez took it out of a, well, that's where it's created near, near Oaxaca. The Cortez took it out of a Montezuma's palace. Okay. Okay. And there was another one he took out of Montezuma's palace. It's still preserved. And I can't pronounce it right. We're, whoever hears this is going to be sound, I'm doing it terrible. It's like the Utah Nuxle Codex or something, but he was a, like a, a encyclopedia for, for Montezuma of all the plants, of all how they were used, like in medicines and dyes, uh, for regalia, for weapons, uh, for uh, sacred rituals of all types. And there was a sacred ceremony to what they call cleansing of the land when you did this. And part of this ceremony, you see when he's, Quetzalcoatl's going into this river, he's going there to recover some of these sacred plants for mankind. And uh, so, could you could you those spell, were two those were two that were taken out and they're still preserved. Could you spell that the, that codex name that you tried to say? I'm going to type it in real quick. Yeah, good idea. Because it's a Nahuatl word, Nahuatl language um, from Aztec. Right. Uh, but Rain, I, I just emailed you uh, what he was talking about. If you want to look at that image, it's okay. The, thank you. The three images he was describing, including the one that we we found. And I think I described that codex there and that it, to you guys uh, when I mm -hmm. sent it to you as a, a letter. You know that. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty there. much sure. Let me see if I can find it again. Yes, yes. Okay, these are the same pictures I have on my phone. Yes. Great. Yeah, so you can kind of see that there's a bunch of stuff going on there, including there's the bee, and then there's four four lizard there, and he has mushrooms kind of growing out of his backside or his, his uh, neck and stuff. Yeah, I was looking at that earlier today, and it's kind of like, I was looking at these images. Wow, very interesting, intriguing. Yeah. It's, it's, hard to say what's going on other than the mushrooms growing out of the top of his head and out of okay, his back. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, the I ones sitting thing. down were, were uh, sitting down. That's four lizard before mush for Quetzalcoatl uh, uh, takes him and it comes 11 lizard. Now, here's the name of that codex it's a codex, and I'll spell it Z O U C H E hyphen N U T A L L. And it's a botanical description of all sorts of plants, grasses, vines, reeds, okay. trees, etc. It describes how they're used for food, textiles, dyes, regalia, weapons, decorations, woven math, and ethnogenic plants. The Codex Zotinutal N U T A L L reveals the use of cocoa during rituals, and page two describes nine rituals to sanctify or order the landscape for plant events. The yeah. most important was the raising of the bundle of sacred plants before the area to be sacri sanctified. These plants were acquired when Lord Seven Places, that's Quetzalcoatl Avatar, descends in the river and retrieves them from the underworld. So, so um, they just, they really funked up the, the, the spelling that I've seen. So Xochinutal, Xochinutal, is the way to pronounce that Zochi Nutel, like Nutella kind of. <laughs> yeah. There's a uh, one or two other codexes. Uh, I think the um, nice. I'm trying to think of one of them, the Borgia Codex or something like that, that also shows sacred mushroom rituals and and mushrooms being used. Uh, another one 
was uh, the Stellas of Xochimilco. These were three Stellas in the highest palace there. Uh, and they were 55 inches tall, 19 inches on one side, and I think about 10 on the other, made of basalt. And these four Stellas tell the same story, but they're like carved into stone. But they actually show things like ceremonial rugs. They show how your feet should go. They show the sacred disembodied eye, female eye, the Quetzal single eye following you on your journey. They show you in the mouth of the jaguar going into the underworld with the wings of Quetzalcoatl behind you, the drops of blood and self-sacrifice, the temple where you would be at when you were taking these mushrooms. And then when you're in the underworld, there's the rabbit that represents your soul spirit that's helping you go through it. Wow. And then you're ascending out of the underworld in the mouth of a combination jaguar, female Quetzal, eagle, and the uh, serpent. And you, you can obviously see the person's in ecstasy coming out. Uh, Does that have something to do with the aphrodisiac and the, and the cacao, the raw cacao beans? <laughs> no, no, this is way past this. That got you ready a long time ago. <laughs> this, is for, this is for meeting and seeing Quetzalcoatl. And this, I mean, when you... Uh, This is a, a really powerful sort of a thing where, you know, the next symbol over there where it shows you is a symbol of a different type of time because the sacred mushroom velada, they call it velada or vigil, it lasts a long time. It seems it lasts for years and years sometimes, you know, and yes. uh, then you come out of it and you're in a different type of time. Time has been changed to a different type of time because then you're reborn. Interesting, interesting. So um, kind of want to bring it back to some of your experiences with Maria Sabina because she is the the ma major patroness of Veladas in, um, in the 70s and, and before that. Uh, you talked a lot the other day, and that maybe it's mentioned in your book quite a bit about visiting with Maria and being in Wautla and um, the other people that maybe were travelers or maybe weren't travelers down to Wautla and sat with, with Maria and other curanderas. Well, I was mainly, uh, I had been to Wautla and does mushrooms with another curandero man, but I was living in the mountains, actually just living there uh, planning on staying and living there. And I lived in a very, very remote area away from uh, the roads or anything on a pasture where hardly anybody came through it except two shepherds, one a woman who would come through with her sheep and then sometimes another uh, man, uh, the current era I told you about. Well, uh, a friend of mine came and he had another friend. He said, let's go to Walla de Jimenez. I said, there's no way I'm going there. I, I hit in a truck the first time I'm going in. I said, I'm not going to get arrested and go to Walla. And he says, well, this guy's got a note from something like the Mexican CIA or something that we can get in as long as we don't go around the town or anything like that. So we went to Walla and got in and, uh, we were having to hide and supposedly we could only be there three days, even with this note because the federales were in the town. And that's when I saw my wife, Shirley, she was with this botanist, this guy and they'd gotten lost and the Indians had taken there. And I said, how in the world did you get to this town? I said, you know, you're not supposed to be out here in the open. You're, you're not supposed to be here. And I said to her, uh, do you know about the mushrooms, you know? And he'd been down there studying plants and they had done some peyote somewhere else and way north. And uh, I said, I'm going to try to go up to see Maria Sabina tonight. I said, are you interested? And she said, yes. And she told David. And it was really interesting because she said then the first thing I saw when I saw you, I want to have your children, which was a weird <laughs> thing. She tell she tells people that because I really look like a wild man, man, you know, 
from living in the woods. But anyway, <laughs> it was a long, long, long hike up to her house. I mean, and it's constantly raining there and you're in clouds and sometimes the yeah. clouds would burst and you were right in the middle of them. And it took a long time. They call it the Eagle's Nest, Waltla, because it's so high up in the clouds. Finally, we made it to her house and we talked to her and her daughter and her son if they would do a ceremony, and they agreed to do one that night. Wow. And everybody else that was with uh, us, uh, everybody else decided to uh, go back down and get maybe some sleeping material or a blanket or something. Because her house was like adobe. The windows were wide open, straw roof. And I just said, I'm not going down. Well, if I make it to heaven, I'm staying here. She said, I, and I asked her if I could stay. And she said, she said, yeah, you could stay. You could stay up here with me today. And so the other, we're going to come back that night. So I spent all day with her observing her daughter and Apollonia. And she made some cacao and gave us some cacao in the middle of the day. And it was incredible, like the clouds coming through the house. I mean, open windows. I remember one time a lightning bolt went in one wind and out the other. Wow. And it was, she didn't even move an inch. She didn't even seem startled. And I just looked around. The only thing, a chicken in the house got upset and jumped up and <laughs> jumped up on a table. But that night when we did the ceremony was really incredible. Uh, she had us all get in a circle. The one thing that seemed the most important was she practiced and practiced and practiced your name to she could say your name like, you say it like if you'd say your name rain i'd probably take a while to i could with my hillbilly I, to pronounce it just like you do but you got it. so when the last time you said it you didn't know who said it and later during the ceremony at night you'd hear your name and it seemed to bounce off a wall somewhere wow because she had a great powerful, ability you hear later, your own name and you know, you're all you're all so much you know, with the own, with the same intonation that you call yourself. I mean, that's a pretty powerful, I and mean, when you say somebody's name in general, it really, you know, elicits their attention. So if, if they're saying it in the way that you say it, I mean, how much more captivating is yeah, that? Yeah, and she had also ventriloquy too. She could throw her voice and her daughter sometimes during the ceremony would make birds chirping or different sounds of nature. And of course there was a storm going on, but she also rubbed dirt from the floor of her house, she rubbed it on my knees. She rubbed that really good. And then she <laughs> took a tobacco plant and rubbed the tobacco plant from my arm right up through here she, as a poultice. She rubbed that on there as a poultice. Uh -huh. And then she went to her altar and there was a Nina de Atocha and John the Baptist, I think, in the river with Jesus and mm -hmm. other, and she would, uh, chant and everything and when she had the mushrooms ready she presented each one of mushrooms but he, she and her daughter emphasized really emphasized when we we're on the mats that wait wait but when eat them don't hesitate everybody eat them all at the same time like you know don't hold back you, you don't sit over there waiting eat everything that she gave you uh-huh and, and, uh, and they were they were paired up and in and honey or something no no there was no honey they were just she gave us to us on Paris, typically on a banana leaf. I think one person got his on a really old piece of newspaper from somewhere. Because <laughs> they didn't have newspapers delivered in Wallace. Somebody must have left it there. Interesting. Well, anyway, then when we're sitting on the mats, uh, it's like, and I explained one of my friend's visions in the book that he had his story about what he saw and felt. And I, I, I described mine and a lot of it's personal, but her chanting, when she started going, you can really feel your body starting to resonate with the earth. You can, you can, you, it's almost like your body starts humming and yeah. your body starts humming and you can feel the spirits of the earth coming out of the ground and uh, the life force of the ground and the, what I call myself the sacred divine feminine and your body coming on. And then I feel like then you have what's called a velada, which is the night vigil in our house. You go on what's called a viaje, which is like this special uh, different places. Like I was sitting next to Shirley who had stayed up there with me 
And I can't explain it, but it's like we felt we had met in previous lifetimes. We'd seen each other in lifetimes, but I don't mean like an ego personality or something. Uh, the Aztec believe there's three parts of you. And one part gets re sort of reincarnated and goes in the energy field and the other two just go away. But it was like, we'd had this sort of thing. And then I had visions of Maria Sabina and I had all sorts of visions of, uh, in my book, what I write about. And there's David there too. My wife, sure. Uh, Shelly, uh, she, she didn't want to write or put her visions down for to put in my book. And so I respected that. And, uh, then uh, when we were leaving, it was really amazing. The next day we spent some time with Maria Sabina and she and Apollonia came up to me and she said, you know, you're gonna go past the army and everything and we want you to be safe getting out. And she says, this will allow you to go and pass through without any trouble. And she gave me these sorosha, which were like almost like, uh, you call them truffles. They look like, uh, they look to me like uh, purple walnut sort of. Yeah. And so I, she gave me these and I actually took them across the border. The way I looked, the border guards really, really, really searched me, you know, and, but they looked right at them. They didn't even know what they were or have a, any idea. They were just, they looked like just walnuts that were purple. <laughs> And I ate those in Tennessee. I took them back to one of my friends and I report in a book. It's, it's, he, he takes them and he lives out in the mountains, sort of this place, King College, and he spent the night going around. You weren't, and weren't joking. Beach. You are a hillbilly, huh? Talking about Yeah, I'm, a real hillbilly. I'm from the mountains of Northeast Tennessee. So my friend, he went around talking to the beech trees that night up on this wood hill. Okay. Anyway, uh, so... Maria Sabina was, there's Henry Munn, a guy, Henry Munn, M-U-N-N, -N, wrote this incredible thing called The Uniqueness of Maria Sabina. You can Google it or find it online. And he talks about her. And there's also people that talk about her poetry. She was considered a sabia, where she really had wisdom besides just being a curandero, that the book of creation was shown to her. When she was a little child, she and her sister had a job of walking with the chickens with the stick to keep the hawks from getting them. Uh -huh. well, uh, so she'd walk around and she would find these mushrooms as a young girl and eat them. Now she was in ceremonies with people of her families who were curanderos and curanderas. In fact, uh, her grandson is doing this now. And I've seen uh, a picture of her great granddaughter in one of these ceremonies uh, participating. Who looks, I felt like she had the same presence of Maria. It's uh Hmm. It gave me chills just thinking about it. It was a, a story about a curandero, uh, and I mentioned in my book, I can't think of the title right now, but he went from uh, Mexico City to, to participate with her with uh, son, and, and he was training this young man who he sent there. He said, part of your training is you're going to have to go there and take the mushrooms. That's part of your training. Makes sense. Yeah, so he went there and took the mushroom, and I know we're missing Oliver Quintera, Quintella on this movie, but it was amazing to see his, uh, what I call modern movie. Uh, yeah, the Little Saints documentary. Yeah, yeah like, Little Saints yeah. Talk to God, because these are all millennial-type people, and Walt had changed a lot, but I felt the sincerity of the mushroom ceremony was there. And also the... Uh, church was way more accepting of it. It seemed like the church had integrated him into the church entirely in Waltla, you know, because Maria Sabina was a great Catholic. She was a midwife. She was a healer. She was known for keeping all her family alive in those conditions and are doing her ceremonies and of great wisdom. And she's sort of like an icon in a lot of Mexico now, sort of like if you go places and you see a Bob Marley t-shirt, but <laughs> I think Bob Marley's all over the world now, but she seems to be limited to Mexico, you know? Well, here in California, we, we've seen her a lot and, and people talk about her all the way up the coast 
where everywhere the mushrooms grow and can be picked uh, wild. Yeah, I was going to say within the mushroom community, her her name is definitely known. In yeah, and I've, I've met with Watson a couple of times. I met with him and Albert Hoffman, who invented LSD and Schultes in '78 at a con, uh, convention of, I guess, people like us in. Uh, San Francisco and I went to see him the year before he died and stayed at his house with him like a day and a half and got permission from his daughter to go to his archives and uh, he, he actually sent me his last book his daughter did he said because I've been exchanging letters and it was really nice that she sent me a letter saying you know your, my dad wanted you to have this book and that book was pretty incredible, especially the part about uh, Jonathan Ott about the disembodied eyes at the temple in Tia the uh, like the uh, disembodied eyes. You know, it reminds yeah, me all over the R.R. Tolkien, Tolkien or something, the eye of what Zoran or something. Right. Yeah. Well, and even this that. was uh, y'all see the uh, type of mushroom ceremony, but. Uh, what really, really irritates the hell out of me sometimes are people printing stuff about Watson that I don't consider true or are really not true at all. I mean, you know about his history. And also people quoting Maria Savina and saying things about her that are absolutely not true. Yeah, tell us about that. Uh-huh. And uh, it, it really irritates me, some of these people. I don't know why they say these things or make up these things. Like one rumor, for example, you hear a lot was all these celebrities went to Walmart. Yeah. Yeah, I've heard as that. As far as any, I can talk and no people there, no people there, no, none of them ever went. None of them. Larry never went there. He was in Cornavaca, but some people there say that John Lennon was there. But, you know, the Beatles never played in Mexico. They, they had a concert in Mexico City that got canceled. But some people say that Lennon was there. But the all the other people you hear about, I don't think they were ever there. Though there was a lot of people there causing a problem where the army had to, and, and the government shut the place down, which was easy to do because you had to go up over this big mountain to come down almost in this bowl-shaped place. You're only like, if I remember, two roads in and out. So they had army posts there and then the federales in the town to make sure they get the undesirables out like me. But, uh, <laughs> then it opened up again after uh, 77. And I guess a lot of things had changed then. And um, Yeah, they're saying Bob Dylan, John Lennon, Mick Jagger, and Keith Richards all visited Maria Sabina. Well, the thing of it is, you never, ever hear any of them ever say they were there. Yeah. You can't find anywhere that they say they were there and you can't find any pictures. Mm-hmm. And I personally don't believe they went there. Not that it matters one way or another, but there are some people there that I believe that as a young child, they believe they saw John Lennon there. Hmm. Well, uh, there's also a rumor that uh, it could have been Paul McCartney. Weird. I heard, yeah, I've heard the John Lennon one, you know, that he maybe he and Yoko went to see her. And that sounds like something you might do. Well, you, you know, you got to realize these places were really rugged and primitive to get to. The, the desert surrounding Walt on the outside looked like some sort of desert on Mars. It was the strangest cactus you could ever imagine. <laughs> and I used to drink pulque a lot to sort of ride in the saddle, if you know what I mean, to get, to get you know, it's a type of homemade beer. Okay. But, uh, uh, there's people that talked about at that time that area was almost like Neanderthal, you know, in fact people still using donkeys, walking and carrying things you know, you found out an awful lot of people that were Europeans or Westerners they would freak out in Mexico City or in the normal places, the culture would just freak them out or they'd get Montezuma's revenge and head <laughs> off you know, there was sort of like a hippie cult place. It's still a place that people went to called Zipolite. Mm. Was back then Nixon had a bounty on people's heads, and uh, the other place was buried in Navidad in the in the north. But Zipolite, there were like Indians and people avoiding the draft, and Europeans and different people there. And you were sort of safe from the federales coming down there because they wouldn't they would they wouldn't go that far. Oaxaca was really controlled politically by the big shots out of Acapulco. 
they had a state government, but it was the big shots in Acapulco that were calling the shots. And that was way north of Puerto Escondido, which was way north of Zipolite. And there weren't any, there was, you know, incredible bouncy, dirty roads. Maybe a farm truck would get in there and out, but you didn't even have buses going there. Right. Super so back out. then people would get on a bus there. with a pig or flowers or produce or chickens and take them to the marketplace or somewhere to sell, you know, like I said, there's no refrigeration. And I, like I said, a, a lot of what I would call normal European people or Western people would be totally, absolutely freaked out by those conditions, you know, no air conditioning, uh, no communication to the outside world. That's yeah. Cool. A lot of those areas are still like that too, even in Southern Texas. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or somebody's been to Southern Texas, I take it. <laughs> yeah. A little bit, a little bit right up there against the, you know, the Mexican border pretty much. That's where the peyote grows. That's what, that was a Weechol area for a while. Absolutely. Yeah, I went to see the Weechol for about two weeks and it was amazing. I was told I'd have to, to spend four days or, or I, I don't know, like two weeks going in by donkey to see them. They're very, very isolated p- places of the isolated. Sierra Madres. On a donkey. That's and I found out that there was this guy that would go up in the area and drop people out on a little plane, a little Piper Cub-like plane. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And he would come back two weeks later. You paid him some money, he'd come back two weeks later. That's how they took some stuff to market. So I went up there, and uh, it was amazing. I came out on a wedding ceremony, but... The thing about the Weechols, what you got to realize, they don't have a city or a basic place back then that you lived in. San Andreas, Cobija, where I went, there wasn't, and you, you'd go over to an area of the Sierra Madres and look out, and you would see, you'd be sitting there, and all of a sudden your eyes would, oh, yeah, there's a hut over there. And you could see these sticks, that somebody's living there. And after about maybe an hour, I would have spotted seven or eight more scattered all over but it was amazing being in the town with the Weechols cause when they would come into town or come in this little place, they normally gathered there for sacred ceremonies. That's why the Catholics would put their church there. Mm. I remember this one ceremony. It's like the, with the peyote button, uh, during the church service, they all shot arrows into Jesus. Nice. You know, mm. because I mean, but you didn't hear anything. These people were incredible. It, it, it reminded me of Maria Sabine. A lot of people were, they were either barefooted or had the barest of sandals on and their feet looked like they grew out of the earth. The, their skin looked the same color as the earth. And these people had an amazing presence. Like uh, they just didn't talk a lot. They, you know, that they, they just really, really didn't talk a lot. Yeah, what they but said. I always stayed up there about like two weeks in that area before I went back down and then that, then I went to the mushroom country, you know. So they do. So they're like really sensitive to each other. They're they're feeding off of each other. Or they're interpreting each other instead of through words, through body language, and through energetic and maybe even telepathic exchange. Do you think? I yeah, mean, I think so. Some and uh, there is it supposedly when they go on this sacred ritual for this sacred uh, peyote. People that have gone with them, and I didn't say when you're out there, they're walking and not saying anything. And then all of a sudden they all turn and shoot at the same peyote button, shoot their arrows. Wow. And, uh, I still have a, a scarf from that area that, that I have, but they would have this sacred ceremony at night, which was sort of like a sacred mu- a type of sacred mushroom ceremony. So sort, sort of called the twine ceremony and everybody sits around a fire pit, right? And they're taking peyote and the head shaman has given them uh, peyote and he, he's doing what he's doing. And there's a sacred mushroom ceremony like this in my book. And what somebody would do, they would tie a piece of the twine and say, throw it in the fire and say, I stole some of your chickens this year. Oh, and somebody wow. else would tie a piece and they throw it in the fire and say, well, I got your goat. And a guy would tie and say, well, I went over and had sex with your wife. Or something they like just that. Like, they just like get like sh- share all their Confessing. darkest secrets, you know. Yeah, like, and oh, you, you know, could, you could actually hear that twine go in the fire. I've been hanging out with like your goat, you know? or something, and just burn up. 
but this was a way of getting rid of uh, the angst. And, and there's a sacred right. mushroom ceremony where you do that too, but you don't have, you could say something or not, but you're just throwing these things you've tied up into the fire, you know? Right, and right. The idea is fire. that, uh, what I say, and this is me, is you have things that are on your mind or bother you or make you cringe. Something that you did was mean or hateful or ugly or something that you did and you're so, and when that memory comes back to you, you can almost feel your body cringe. Oh my gosh, did I do that? Let go of it. And so when you do this, it's a way of uh, sort of like exercising it. Right. Right. And letting it go. But the, you know, the, the we Chol were very special people. Like only the shaman was supposed to say the name of their God. Wow. How did you and, get into uh, this stuff, Tom? How did they get? How did you get into uh, to all these little places? They just have good luck, or do you know the right people? Yeah. Well, it's just I went to Barrio de Navidad and I found out about this place, San uh, Andreas Cabeja, and I, and I found out about the Weecholes, and I said, "Well, how do I get up there?" And I found out it'd take about two weeks or more by a donkey to get there, <laughs> and then this guy. Who was there said, well, this this little plane flies up on that plateau about twice a month. So I found out where the pilot was and asked him to drop me off when he went up there. It's it's wild. There. Yeah, what I'm what I'm asking, it's it's more of a maybe an esoteric, like how did you how did your intentional field, how did you manifest these relationships, these opportunities? Just, well, I guess when I was down there, you know, uh, and I felt some of this stuff uh, from Barrio de Navidad, which is like almost like a hole in the wall place like Zipi I went to this little Catholic church where they were selling some of the wee child's things for them, you know, to help them make money. Yeah. And I really, really uh, was impressed by this stuff. I could see, like, for instance, uh, I could show you a picture or two I've still got on the wall if you want to see them. I could just pick, pick them off and take me a second. Yeah, you mean the yarn yarn art, the uh yeah, the yeah. Like yarn art, yeah. I know yeah, what you're uh, uh let me I'll get to it. I'll just take yeah. a second. Well. So if you're listening to the show, this is uh Hugh T Alchemy with <laughs> in Theo Radio, and I have a special guest on today, Tom Lane, and I'm being joined by Rain Grant, who is Ken Mushroom Save the Planet documentarist. And this is, if you're watching the video, we're seeing Tom show um, looks like a sacred weechel ceremony to honor. The yeah, spirit. and uh, you can see uh, the Curandero there. Uh, uh, the, their special name for him, I forget it right now. And there's a sacred fire, and there's peyote, and the spirit coming out of the fire. Wow! And that's wow. it, man. That's that's something else. And then here's another one. Oh, it's a flying reindeer. Well, on. this reindeer. sacred deer, and I was up there talking to this one guy who was translating in Spanish. And he was actually t tell him, talking to me about having sex with the sacred deer. I mean, it was really far out listening to some of these guys. I mean, <laughs> sacred spirit deer. And then you see the peyote and stuff. But these, these things go the deer way back. Or the deer itself. Uh, I'm sorry. I lost you there. <laughs> they, these, these things go way back to 73 and early. They're, they're pretty original stuff. And I also have a scarf, which I won't show you, about the squirrel that stole fire from the gods for the wee chals. Wow. And... Uh, then I went to the museum in Mexico City because I wanted to learn about the sacred mushroom and and I was blown away. I could just feel the statues vibrating. And especially one time I was in front of the statue called Kolakit. She was the one that turned into the Virgin uh, of Guadalupe. Yes. And she's then... two-headed with two snakes coming out of the stop, top and skulls all around her and everything. I'm going to bring up a picture of her. And it was like, you know, I had been in the Army infantry, and, you know, sometimes you gain a thing of a, of a presence or like you're a hunter, that there's something around that you better 
your back's starting to crawl or you feel like something really strange is going on. Yeah. And uh, all of a sudden, okay, I could feel my skin crawling, <laughs> you know, and uh, so I turned around and looked and there, there, there was this statue. That's interesting. And it was just unbelievable. And then, then that's when I decided to go to Chichen Itza and Palenque in that area. And I was really lucky when I was in Palenque. That's when they let you climb Palenque. I don't think they do anymore. And I was there after night. I actually slept on it because the guards weren't watching. There weren't anybody there. <laughs> they have this one room at this great pyramid there, the Pyramid of the Sun. Okay. And it was only open one hour a day. And there wasn't a lot of people when I was there. And this guy said, you want to go up to the top room? And I said, yeah. And so we climbed inside and went inside. And it just seemed like it took forever. And, and that's when I got in there. I saw the red jaguar. And that had a stunning effect on me. It looked like its eyes were following me. Oh, wow. Really? And were you on mushrooms at this time? Or is this? Oh, no, 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 no. I hadn't I'd done any mushrooms till later when I went to Palenque. Right. So you were just... And, uh, you were just a friend of mine, Maria, the ethnography of the area. You were just kind of exploring the way that Richard Evan Schultz explores, right? Well, I wouldn't put myself in his category, but I was out <laughs> trying to find this stuff out. And uh, uh, it was just amazing to me how things were carved. Like, for an example, if you go out in front of this great pyramid, and I could show you a picture of this, but I won't. But there, there's two huge, it looks like monster rattlesnakes coming from the top down. And on the equinox, on either side, it, the sun actually makes the scales oh. of, the, of, of, the, of the serpent Quetzalcoatl. Huh. The scales are actually made on the equinox. You can look up Chichen Itza equinox, and you'll see that. You'll see the scales actually form. Wow. That sounds amazing. And uh, another thing is, if you stand out in front of the pyramid and clap your hands anywhere out in front of the pyramid, uh-huh. it, it makes echo? a chirrup sound of the Quetzal bird. If you do like that, oh. the echo off of it is a, is a sound of the Quetzal bird. Interesting. 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 Uh, some of these pyramids are unbelievable. Like, I don't know if you've discovered a Tiwatiwakan they discovered a tunnel underneath it recently. Mm -hmm. And this is in National Geographic. And they actually found a pool of mercury on the center at, at the very center. Wow. Wow. At this pool of mercury. And I have some friends that were there during the solstice where some of the people that knew that archaeologists got permission to go back in there. They said at the height of the solstice, the mercury in the whole place started vibrating. Oh, wow. I'm curious. Oh, no. We don't want to scare Rain away. This could be a little bit of a conspiracy theory. <laughs> I'm sensing, sensing the vibration of conspiracy. What, what do you think? Uh, I want to get back to aphrodisiacs, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> she's, like, she's like, there's one portal, and we're only going through that one. <laughs> but oh, no, boy. really. No, I'm curious. I, I would love to know. And I'm, I'm all... I'm all in for occult uh, and paranormal research, and Absolutely. there's there's a lot of pyramids throughout the world that have these weird underground chambers, and there's one in China that had mercury in an emperor's tomb. So what what do you think, Tom? Is is the mercury related to with these? I don't know. You know, if you go to National Geographic, it's fairly recent. They discover you about discovering this, and they found the mercury and everything. But I have a group of friends that I've done sacred mushrooms in the desert before, and they know somebody, and they go down there for the solstice. And this one time, I don't know if it happened the second time they went there, somehow because of the person they knew and the archaeologist, they got to go back there. And they said they mentioned something of seeing uh, Talak, but they said at the high noon of the solstice, the mercury just started quivering and vibrating there, and you could feel the whole earth vibrating and resonating. Wow. Interesting. Wow. Yeah. How interesting. And, so, you know, Palenque was unbelievable. Like, Palenque, Pascal, 
uh, the great god of the Mayans, when Plinky was discovered, he was totally isolated in the jungle, covered up. And supposedly, Chickle Tree people took some people back there and showed them where Plinky Well, Plinky would be sort of like a spiritual center of the Mayans in the jungle there, it just hums. I mean, you're, you feel like you're in a jungle, a triple canopy jungle, and it's humming. Well, something like 20, 50 years, I don't know how long after it was discovered, they discovered at the very top, if you open this particular, they found an opening, and it went down a spiraling staircase that you could just barely, you know, maybe two people walk side by side. When they get to the bottom, there's this sarcophagus, which has a lid on it that is about like uh, bigger than a really big door and like made of thick stone about like six inches thick. And when they slid it back, it's all in the Museum of Mexico City now and a replica there. Of course, they couldn't get the stone out of there because this whole thing had to be built around it. But the Pascal is like covered in jade. His whole face, his body is covered in jade. But on the top, you can see him, and there's this sacred tree of life that's growing, coming out of the earth, going to the heavens. And he's picking like sacred mushrooms off of it. You're talking about Pakal, the uh, Ahau Pakal? Yeah, they, it's, there's sort of two different names for him. Uh, he, he spelled two different ways. Uh, and I believe he brought, he was one that must have brought all this uh, information to his people, you know, right? and trained them in certain ways. You know, one thing the uh, Aztec and especially the Mayans were into was a type of astrology that's totally different than ours. Yes. You know, Venus has an 854-day rotation around the sun. The Earth has a 365, and of course, you know about the rotation of the Earth around, I mean, the moon around the Earth. Well, these three rotations, the Mayans figured out a way of, of alignment. You know, like you'd move something like this to line all three up. Mm -hmm. sure, sure. And they were aware that certain things happen on certain days, like they were aware that sunspots happen on certain days and it would affect your blood and affect your body. Wow. And this type of astrology was more like omen like, okay, this energy is coming in from the sun. This energy is coming in from the, the alignment of Venus, the sun, and the earth. And most people that study this believe that these ancient sages said, okay, my great grandfather, back when there was this alignment, this is what he and the people said happened. And it's in this alignment again, and we're feeling the exact same thing happen again you know, the same type of uh, vibrations and stuff and the ability of, you know, to affect people here on earth. So these were the three things that they were really interested in. And they actually knew way before the Europeans that vote, that Venus rotated counterclockwise. Mm -hmm. And Venus was the most important thing because you see Venus represented also going into the underworld. It was called the, uh, morning star in the morning, but also the, the Lord of the dawn, the evening star. And a lot of this symbolism of death and rebirth right. evolved around the male-female serpent going in and going through the underworld and coming out again in an ascension to the sun. This was a type of energy that transferred between the earth and the sun. And uh, mm. You can really see this in rain. If you're out in a rainy, sunny day sometime, you can see the plants singing and sending all this energy flowing through the ground of the earth and the sun, and it's going back and forth. Oh, yeah, I bet. <laughs> yeah, there's some interesting correlations between the morning star, Lucifer, and the mm -hmm. serpent, the snake, and the, DM, uh, the, the DNA caduceus symbols. And again, it's mercury. And we we hear about the uh, the the hermaphrodite Hermes again. We're we're gesturing at the idea that Mercury and Quetzalcoatl are these beings that are neither male or female, or that can be male and female simultaneously. Yeah, to the Aztecs and to the uh, Mesoamericans, it wasn't so much hermaphroditic, though they all recognize things like homosexuality, like 
Cochapilli and different ceremonies and they didn't label people, but they considered male and female, like life and death, share the same spine. And the idea was you have to get in balance on earth. There wasn't an idea of good and evil, like the Christian good and evil. If you ask the Aztec what's good or what's evil or a sinner, they had no concept of that, but they had a concept that the earth is a really slippery place and you have to get your life in balance. And this was what all this rebirth is about. And it wasn't an easy thing. Like there's this ancient Aztec story about a beggar, a rag picker, and he finds a sacred box. And this box has all these sacred jewels and stuff in them. And it's relating to the mushroom. It's like divination. It's like all these cures. It's all these things to heal with. And uh, these special Jules, and he can't figure any of them out. He knows it's important. So he goes to a priest and he has the priest, well, show me how to work. Uh, show me how to make this work. Uh, show me what to do with it. And the priest says, well, you know, this takes years. You have to learn this. I can't just show you this right now. And so the beggar gets really mad and tries to kill him. Hmm. And of course, then all these spirits come out of the lake, the trees, the, the pond, and they tear the beggar up and throw him in the lake or do away with him. But it's more like a mythological tale to, to, have, to let people know that these things are, you know, valuable tools, but you have to spend time, uh, sort of like Quetzalcoatl will often spend time in caves meditating on this or in mm. doing a certain type of penance, you know, in, in regards to this. And, uh, it, you know, you had to learn these things. This is what blows me away when somebody thinks they go to a tourist trip to South America or take a seminar online, and now they're a, a shaman or <laughs> a curd Darrow. You know, for one thing, it's the plant that chooses you, and there's incredible stories. There's a story in Walla about this guy had seen six doctors and didn't want to, you know, uh, they couldn't heal him, and he comes to Walla, and he sees a curandera there, and he is in a ceremony. And the ceremony in there that says, you can be healed, but you have to become a curandera. And the guy says, well, I don't want to do this. I live back in the city here and there. And so I'm sorry, you have a choice. Well, it doesn't matter to us. There, it, it just doesn't matter. It's a choice, you know. If you want to be healed, here's the path, and you have to become a curandera. And, and supposedly the guy did. Oh, wow. One of the most amazing stories I heard in 78 at the conference was about this woman who was told she only had like three months to live or less than three months, probably sometime between two to three months. And she was given the mushrooms. And the story was that she was like um, two months or month and a half pregnant. And when she took the mushrooms, her baby got in touch with her and told her, oh, this ain't going to work. You have to live. Okay. You have to, we're going to, you're going to have to heal your body because I can't live if you don't live. And at the time, I thought it was some type of mental telepathy or intuition. Oh, yeah. Even I'll without about even a minute. plant medicine, you can connect with But later, people. I found out in a 2016 article of Scientific Magazine that the baby and the mother are actually sharing brain cells. Oh. So there's a type of connection there. You know, a sacred connection between the mother and the baby, but... That was amazing effect on uh, that story. You know, that's this was 1978 when Hoffman and Watson and Schultes were there. You know, that story just Did blew Watson me. have a son? I just I'm throwing that out. I think I think he reached out to me. I mean, it was either Watson or somebody else's son. Is that possible? Does anybody know the answer to that? To what about that? No. Watson I'm... having a son. That he had a daughter, him. Masha. Okay. I think he may have had a son. I know his daughter, Masha. Uh, I think she lives in Texas now. Okay. Mm. And you sort of have to get permission from her to visit the uh, archives or everything if you're, Uh uh, you know, not a scientist or something. You know, like with me, I had all these letters I'd say from Watson and the letters from her, and I sent them the archives, and I said, uh, I'd like to come see this and research certain things, you know, and so... I think they contacted her and I got permission for spend about two days there looking for, and Watson was unbelievable. Very, files very he kept. There's going to be a story come out in 2026 
about the Amani and Mascara and the Ojibwe tribe, one of the things that was really disappointing when I saw him in, in 86, you know, and I corresponded, but I hadn't talked about it. I said, where's your book about Kianokwe and the Ojibwe and everything? Because I had cassette tapes of her and everything. He brought her there, and she had told all these stories about use of Amanita Mascara of uh, these Indians on the Canadian American border up in central, you know, the central places around Michigan in that area. and. Uh, he said, well, I'll, I'm not going to publish that book now. He said, uh, she didn't want me to, and I'm going to hold off. And it, But the, the, I found out at the archives, that's going to be released in 2026, which is wow. about, I guess, six, six or seven years from now. It'll be made available to the public. And uh, there's... Very interesting, yeah. That, yeah, and... Uh, on 2026. No. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, but he was a real gentleman, Watson. He was just an unbelievable gentleman, and uh, nice, especially Hoffman too and Schultes. I came up to all three of them. I remember the first thing I saw them over there after the talking. I just walk up to them, just like you know, a normal hillbilly walking up to them, and I said, "Hey, I'm gonna ask you a question." And the first question I ask is. What do you think about all this Carl's Costanata stuff? And Watson looked at me and the thing he said, Costanata isn't real, but now Don Juan is. <laughs> and uh Yeah. Hoffman and Schultes both nodded and then we talked a little bit about that. And Watson carried on a tremendous amount of correspondence with Costanata, way after other people were calling him a fraud and a total thing. He was being a real gentleman. And when I was looking through his files, I saw one thing that absolutely proved that Castaneda was a fraud to me was uh, he was carrying on these letters and he asked him, he said, well, where did you find these mushrooms? Did you go south or this uh, Don Mateos or whatever, you know, the little smoke? And he said, well, that he could command them to grow anywhere out of the earth. He could command them to grow. I thought to myself, what absurd BS. Nobody can command a plant. You can enjoy plants and plant spirits. You can work with them. But the idea that you're going to command this mushroom to grow out of the earth, there's no curandero or shaman or anybody on the earth that can do that. You know, that's ridiculous. He's claiming that he commanded the mushroom and it just came up out of the ground. It just like, came up out of the desert. Wow. And you've got these other curanderos like um, I mentioned uh I think it's called the serpent, the sun who had, it, they knew they had, when I was there in the mountains, there were some curanderos that came down there to get mushrooms and a couple of them, because they didn't grow down there. They gave me some peyote. They had brought some peyote with them. Okay. So that's cool. And uh, nice. this whole idea it's he did a tremendous amount of damage. Uh, hmm. Especially the idea about, eating or drinking uh, doctoras. I saw people actually lose their mind. I'm talking about going nuts. Right. That were crazy enough to drink that stuff or, or drink a tea from it. It was often rubbed on the body different places. But I have a chapter in my book about that, that they relate to werewolfism, where people that would drink those teas and stuff, they'd go through a Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And you didn't want to be around anybody like that. And this is your book, Mushroom Rituals? Sacred, Sacred Mushroom, Mushroom Rituals, A Search for the Blood of Quetzalcoatl. It has about three or four ch pages in there about uh, the use of tobacco or doctors or brugamancia during these ceremonies. Very nice. So in your book, do you uh, have any of these like recipes and things like that, you know, having to, having to do with? The, the mushroom rituals or um you know how, how, how i do some i go. talk about in particular in the i'm writing a new book on the sacred mushroom of the deified heart but the last i talk about taking it and ascribing it just like i did to you just now and then i talk about some of these events but i talk about the main thing is for you to consider it a sacrament right and not get hung up on a certain type of ritual or anything to you know respect yeah. the earth and yeah. don't have any pre can songs or anything i say okay if you're a buddhist like i've done it with buddhists and had them touch 
chant nine ball range, hey, you know, and sure, sure. something that's interior to you, a certain type of meditation, a certain type of chant. Sure, you know, it seems like it's it really was, personal uh, when you're doing any of these. There's not something pre-canned here, and you know, you're, you know, you're with your people, with people or people somewhere, and you're. It's more like you're recognizing that this is sacred to you, that this is the sacrament. And that's why I don't use words like magic or hallucinogenic or uh, psychedelic, because I believe the way you speak, the way you talk, the, your respect for what you're doing, you have to have that to really make, to enter these portals or everything, because, the, you know, the mushrooms are more, they're closer to an animal than a plant. You know that, right? Absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. And so, you know, I know they, what they're feeling and like that, like I've, I've gone to pick mushrooms before, especially the Zapotecas, and actually had them start dancing, moving all around. I'm not talking about moving back and forth like this. I'm talking about going up or down. And uh, I believe it. I grow a kombucha, and I sing to my kombucha, and I've seen it. The mother itself starts swaying, and I was like, what? So absolutely. I mean, it's, it's conscious. It's aware. It's energetic, and it's going to respond to stimuli. And sound right. is powerful. And, uh, you know, I remember one time we were in there and we were singing to the mushrooms and they started dancing. This one girl from America, she, she was like, she passed out. It was too much for her consciousness. Wow. She, lucky she was on a mat. And later she woke up and we told her and we had a ceremony and she wanted to think we're all somebody special or that we were some type of guru or current Daryl. Finally, we had to t tell her to leave, you know this isolated place I said you, you know this is all comes from you we don't have anything that you can't get you know you've got to quit thinking that there's something special about well it was Tony and Lowe and myself and you know this is all within you I mean people have to get by past the infantile stage of like they need some guru or something or they need something they just need to be shown what to do and to travel within to find it and everything and know that these feelings that they're loved and they'll be taken care of and that there are some ceremonies where, you know, there's sort of a ceremony where you go into the underworld and you meet total fear and total uh, death. And the only way you overcome that is by loving it. Yeah. And things change. I went to a place where every root was a rat trying to eat me and the leaves on trees were snakes trying to bite me. And it was just like, I formed this image of Quetzalcoatl and it was like, okay, love all this and love every bit of it. And it all changed. It really changed. Everything went back. And then I went into a really meditative state and it's, um, this Curandero had told me, he said, you know, everybody could take the trip to heaven and some people want to go into the underworld and see what it's like. And he says, you're too damn curious. I know you want to do it one time, you know? And so I made that thing. And then later, some, sometimes the first time, not after that Quetzalcoatl will come as a big dragon, a black dragon going to devour you and everything. And that's mm -hmm. the first time he came to me. And it was like, I guess to scare me off. And I said, okay, wow, that's fantastic. You're going to eat me and I'm going to turn you into pure love. I love you. I'm going to, uh, infinite and kindness and when you swallow me up you'll change and then immediately turn into diamond rainbow serpent oh wow so yeah bringing it back to what you were saying in the very beginning about um you know channeling this or quetzalcoatl coming in and, and and teaching you how to embrace love and joy and gratitude and and and, and being able to face totally in face your fears and, and, and death you know and that's basically you know what we all struggle with it seems like in life in general many people are afraid of death and afraid of life and life and death really yeah that's right and you know it's uh the uh the power of the healing and everything comes from getting rid of that fear you know, and once you get rid of that fear, then there's not a whole lot left. Of course, you keep your sanity and your wisdom about you. And some things were really amazing. I remember one time there was this shepherdess, and she was amazing. She actually, I watched her deliver birth to a baby in the field with her sheep. And she had a little daughter with her. And she'd come into my hut sometimes, and she wasn't really a curandero or anything, but she'd come one time and she said she wanted me to come help or pray or something. She lived way up in the mountains and uh, her daughter had gotten really, really sick. 
and she'd given her daughter mushrooms and nothing had happened. And uh, she'd taken them herself and her daughter was sick. She thought she was going to die. So I went up there and it was the biggest lightning storm I've ever seen in my life. The whole mountain was shaking with the lightning and everything. We felt like a lot of the people that maybe Tollock was around and we were in there. We didn't have mushrooms. We were just at this little altar. And a lot of the people up there where they had a doorway, there's no door. It's just an opening. And uh, there was a candle or two in there. And this sounds amazing, but in the middle of the night, all of a sudden we see this brujo in the door and he walks over and touches the girl on the head and just puts her hand on for, for a while and then turns around and walks out. Wow. And it was like, we were both looking, it was really amazing. If I hadn't seen water on the floor or the drippings, I would have thought it was uh, like uh, a dream or I hadn't really seen it because there was lightning flashing and, I just felt like Talak in the mountain answered that it was her prayers and everything that brought him, brought, caused him to come there, that he didn't really have a choice, that he was basically told by Talak to go there and heal this young girl. Beautiful. There's some really powerful life experiences you have, and, and it, it seems to me like you've, you've sought out the extraordinary, and you've traveled and you've experienced cultures um, in a way that a lot of people were afraid to during a generation in which the war on drugs was really, really prevalent. Yeah, it was really uh, freaky when I came back to with my wife, Shelly, and we lived in uh, St. Louis. We lived in this old house at Laclede, and we discovered ways of growing the mushrooms that were sort of really underground there. People were even almost scared to talk to you. Yeah and growing them in auger and transplant was a huge horrible thing technique to do and a lot of times it didn't work but we grew lots and lots of mushrooms but we always gave everything away and gave it to people people were blown away why are you not even charging for the jars and i said look i don't want any karma involved with uh money and mushrooms and i said you know i just don't want to do that but there were some amazing things that happened to people uh that I describe a few things in the books from, but now it's unbelievable how people can grow it from uh, these uh, syringes that get sent with spores in them. And technically they're not illegal, you know? Right. So recently I, I, I've done that a little bit, but I'd always gone out in a cow pasture or in here in Florida and found them when this, everything was right, you know? Just get them out in the wild. Yeah. So that's, those, those are wonderful sacred journeys, and a lot of these stories are told in your book, Sacred Mushroom Rituals, The Search for the Blood of Quetzalcoatl. Where can people find your book, Tom? Well, it's on Amazon, and the book on Amazon is 308 pages and uh, eight and a half by 11, and a lot of color pictures. I spent a lot of money on the art design of this book. Beautiful. Yeah, it looks and it's beautiful. a little expensive. It's like $58, I think. But the Kindle version is just uh, $9.99. Okay. Very nice. All right. So people can order it from you on Amazon and also put it on their Kindle. And how, how do I get a copy from you with your autograph? <laughs> Sign uh, it. Well, tomorrow I'm leaving for Brazil, so that's a little tight. But if you send me something uh, with your email and address on it and everything, and I just sell my books uh, for the same price as Amazon, like $58, because I spend a, a lot of money on shipping. I have to put it in a very special shipping container with a lot of plastic and everything, so it gets to you. You know, it costs me about $10 to ship, and Amazon does it for free. Sure, sure. Nice. nice. Yeah, so I, I want to encourage people to reach out to you. What's the best way for people to find you and contact you? If it's not your website, then give us some social media. Yeah, uh, the, my Facebook site, Sacred Mushroom Rituals and Ceremonies, is probably one of the best, or my email, Tom Lane, L-A-N-E, Solar, S-O-L-A-R, at gmail.com. Excellent. And I want to thank you and all the listeners and our uh, guest host, Rain Grant, for being on the show in Theo Radio today. Anything you want to say, Rain? Um, yeah, just uh, this is beautiful information, and I think it's all really good to collect the data like this. And I'm really glad to be able to connect with people through the, the mycelial web of the internet and beyond. <laughs> 
Yeah, you know, it's like Terrence McKenna talked about this. He never really had any uh, Coranderos or people he worked with, according to Dennis, when I talked. But the Internet enables us to connect it and spread information and get this information out there. And to me, it's very important to people to realize to do this in the wilderness during the day or do it in the wilderness and I know it's good, but this idea of sitting down on a couch with binders on, listening to uh, classical music and taking a pill <clears throat> may be beneficial, but it's not part of what I consider the reverence of, this, of the world, of the real world that's out there, this parallel world. I'm glad that you're saying that and talking about the wilderness and the importance of doing this in the space of, of nature and being in touch with nature. You know, there are those like Terrence McKenna and some of his uh um, followers who are um, adamant that you have to do it in a dark room, isolated, and a heroic dose. You know, so I, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure each ha has its um, benefits, and um, but nature seems to be the grand teacher. Well, even at night and everything, the Aztecs were very much about this in nature. How you had your feet, and Maria Sabina rubbing the dirt on your earth, on your knees, and you know, like uh, being out in nature in the real world. We're We've got to get out. Of, you've got to get out of this plastic world and everything that's around. I, like I try to tell people is, uh, you know, go to somewhere where you, you don't hear the sounds of civilization and you uh, are isolated from anybody bothering you and everything. And to a sacred spring or high in the mountains somewhere. Uh, and uh, that's where you can enjoy these spirits and they're still there. There's nothing unique. They're, this parallel world exists for all of us. Absolutely. Yeah. Well said. And well experienced. Thank you for going through this process with your lifetime, this on. lifetime, and sharing with uh, the world through this podcast and other podcasts you have on your website and your book. Like uh, you're, I think maybe like the, uh, you were saying in the beginning of this conversation, the most important days uh, of your life are your, you know, your birthday and the day you realize your purpose. And it seems like you've had at least a few days where you realized your purpose, Tom. Yeah, and it's, you know, it's a struggle when you come back to this world and you will come back to what I call the desert of the real. You know, when you come out of the real world, which is the real world of nature where dwelling people live, and you come back into the technological world, especially into the digital world, you know, and everything that's going on, it's, it's hard to keep your sanity. There's a long time, I only did it, like once or twice a year just to check up and try to recover my sanity from the world I was working in, you know, as a solar contractor and everything at the time and just in that business of installing solar and everything in, in the world because the world seems to be getting nuttier, nuttier, nuttier as far as our relationship as dwelling people to the environment. And what I mean by that is the idea that a dwelling person sees a tree and he sees the spirit and he sees his relationship to it and he can actually in a way, talk to the trees, some of these people, where a technological person just sees so many board foot and lumber and maybe a house being built from that lumber. I see, yeah. And, you know, because our technology can control us. That's the scariest thing. Uh, I really like Mike Martin Heidegger and his philosophy, and he talks about being in the aspect that a lot of this technology, we think we're in control of it, but it's actually in control of us. He, I understand that completely. When I see someone obsessively scrolling social media all the way down, what are you looking for? I'm like, is, is there is there medicine in your social media scroll? Because there's not in any of mine. There is. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, Huxley talked a lot about the soma and how people be somatized with drugs. Mm. And I really think that was the truth more than... Uh, Orwell with the big Nazi police only for the people to get out of line. But they've actually shown that these cell phones now, I know we're at the end of this, they, they create a thing called like nonophobia and it actually is setting off endorphins in people's minds when they ring and stuff like that. And it really seems like it's affecting women in certain ways and men in certain ways, but it's creating a lot of negative things that people don't understand. Uh, it's, in a way, it's a type of mind control. You're being programmed, really being programmed, much more than TV or anything like that. I feel I was lucky. I never seen saw a TV till I was 10 years old. Nice, nice. Well, uh, you're one of the elders in the, I would call it, shamanic and theogenic community. Um, 
And I want to thank you again for being on the show. And I hope that in a few months when you're back from your travels that we can hear from you again. And your next book will be coming out soon, next year? No, it'll be about three years from now. All right. You've got, you guys got a copy, a preview of one of the chapters. I'm sort of slow in writing this stuff because I'm researching a lot of stuff. It takes a lot of time to figure out who Eleven Lizard is and Four Lizard and Nine Eagle Woman. <laughs> nice. nice. <laughs> Thank you for doing that research. It feels paramount as, as some, somebody who was a Mayanist during the years leading up to 2012, I, I feel really akin and at home speaking about Mayan and other other ancient technologies like like reading those hieroglyphs and understanding and interpreting ceremony yeah so all uh, right well i guess uh is it goodbye for now it is a uh, fine tom lane's book sacred mushroom rituals the search for the blood of quetzalcoatl find it on amazon.com and you can look him up T-O-M-L-A-N-E, and uh, that's his author's name, and, and it looks like Joe Lane, and maybe your brother or something like that. He also co-authored. No, that was my son. He oh. wrote uh, one chapter on the musicality of Maria Sabina. Very nice. So we're mentioning your son, Joe Lane. and so Yeah, and he and also Lane. did a chapter. He wrote a lot of it on Sochapilli and did a lot of research on Sochapilli. Very cool. Very cool. So... Check this book out. Get it while it's still available. It looks like it's going to be a collector's item one day. It, it comes in an amazing uh, full color printing. And um, you can find Tom on Facebook uh, under Sacred Mushroom Rituals fan page or group. Uh, it's a Facebook, this is a Facebook group. Anybody can join Sacred Mushroom Rituals and Ceremonies. But we also go into Ayahuasca a lot. We go into... Mm -hmm uh peyote we go into we haven't done too much in san pedro and e even cannabis being used as a, a sacrament like tibetan temple balls or certain types of cannabis used in tibet and other places as a sacrament excellent excellent so uh yeah this is captain hugh t alchemy within theo radio please tune in and enjoy uh this podcast and many others across the podcast media and distribution networks we have uh, Spotify, CastBox, we're on Facebook. You can find us on uh, Twitter and Instagram. And we're now on iTunes. Just look us up, E-N-T-H-E-O Radio, In Theo Radio, with Rain Grant and Trevar and Tom Lane today. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye, Vieja. Bye, Vieja.